I want to start with your house price index out this morning. House prices continuing to rise. Do you think we're getting near the top of a housing cycle? So we continue to see positive appreciation, but it's also important to look at that the rate of increases started to slow over the last couple of years. So I think we're still going to have another couple of years of positive appreciation, but it's going to be a little bit lower. So we are starting to see a little bit of softening. But again, the underlying fundamentals are quite strong, and that's mostly being driven now by the job market. So as the prices have gone up, are we starting to see more risks being taken in loans? Well, we are worried about that. We are concerned about that. Historically, after you get big refinance waves, the industry tends to try to keep volume going by reducing standards. And of course, you know, we're always on the outlook for potential fraud. You know, we've heard a lot of stories, for instance, of fake employers in California and other places like that. So we are starting to see some elements of that that raise some concerns. But at this point, I don't think it's at a troubling level. Not a repeat of the financial crisis. Well, we hope not. We hope not. But it's important important that we keep on the outlook for that. Uh, anytime you start to see markets, you know, do this well in the real estate market, and anytime you start to see the refinance business kind of pan out and everybody wants to keep volumes going, there's going to be pressure to make, make those sales and those loans. Now, Fannie and Freddie, big issue for you, getting them out of conservatorship. As you go forward, what's the thinking now, that you can do it unilaterally or are you going to need legislation? So we can, by statute already, fix Fannie and Freddie and release them from conservatorship. We can't fix the basic model. So... I have the model I have, I can do what I can to get them back out and try to make sure they don't get back in by being better capitalized, but there's some real fundamental flaws to the model that only Congress can fix. Will you be going to Congress with proposals to try we, to get them? We, yes, we will. Uh, we will be asking for bigger uh, changes, such as I, I think that the consumer benefits from competition. You know, I've asked for chartering authority to be able to issue additional charters. This also has the benefit of not ever bringing competition, but it also helps reduce too big to fail. You know, we've got two of these entities, we're really dependent on them. If we had five or six or seven, then any one or two of them could get in trouble and you'd be less likely to have to rescue them. You've talked about reducing risk in yeah. their models and in their portfolios. If you did that, would you need them? Well, ultimately, I think that you can strengthen them and make sure that they're safe and sound. So to me, the primary purpose of Fannie and Freddie is to be a countercyclical liquidity. So at a time of stress, they're a floor under the market. That's going to be important even for good quality loans. And historically, you know, it really was only to the 90s that the credit quality at Fannie and Freddie really started to decline. So they have an important role. I think they have an important role that can support quality lending. And we want to make sure that that's what they're focused on. Well, in terms of their role, What's your goal? Uh, it used to be that we wanted everybody to own a house. Where are we? Well, I, that hasn't changed, but what's different and what I think is important is we want the home ownership to be sustainable. Uh, we saw last time where we got a lot of people in at the top of the market, and they got wiped out, lost a lot of wealth, lost their jobs, found themselves underwater. So what we're really focused on is that the home ownership that Fannie and Freddie and the federal home loan banks are providing is sustainable home ownership so that we get somebody in, they're in to stay. We know this is going to be a success story. Let's talk about the timetable for getting them out. Uh, you're talking about it as a 2021 event? Well, I also want to emphasize first, it's process dependent, not calendar dependent. I'm, I'm not circling a date where we're pushing them out. What we're focused on is the things that we need to do, I think will at least take us another year to do the things we need to build up Fannie and Freddie, to build up the agency so there was an agency we're ready for an exit. So there are a lot of pieces that need to be put in place. Uh, I would love if we could do a big capital raise today, but the, we're just not in that position yet. You're trying to give them $45 billion in additional capital to above the $3 exactly. billion that each has now. How long is that going to take? So that should get us to about the first quarter of next year by our estimates. And certainly we don't want the sweep to come back. So before then, certainly the intention is to either remove that cap altogether or at least raise it to give us additional time. Well, you're doing at the same time a uh, reduction, in, uh, an increase, actually, in the liquidity preference for you. Uh, do, does that match one for one? At currently, it does. And it's likely that any additional short-term increase would have a one for one match. Uh, there are some legal requirements that, that Treasury has to do it that way. So, um, you know, we do what the Treasury lawyers suggest in this regard. <laughs> what do you do about the government guarantee? Uh, well, only Congress uh, could come point. in and make that explicit. So we are calling for Congress to come in and define the situation. Uh, my view is that when Congress, if and when Congress does this, it should be very clear what's covered. So, for instance, my suggestion has been any guarantee should be on MBS only and should not be on unsecured debt. But only Congress can really clarify this situation. And I do think it's incredibly important to clarify this situation. Well, do you need it clarified to let them go? You don't. Not, not under statute. 
you know, no, no, what no. statute, but practically. What, what practically, well, I will say under statute, I'm required to fix them and get them out. Uh, I think the best thing I can do is build up capital, have a safe and sound system where investors can look at these and say they're well-run companies, it's a good investment, but ultimately at the end of the day, there are limits to what we can do without congressional action. Now, is 45 the minimum capital for them to be set free? Would you like a higher capital standard? So I will say we're in the middle of a rulemaking. We're going to be reproposing a capital rule soon in, in the coming weeks, months. That will give a better definition of what we expect capital to be. So at this point, we don't have a number. Uh, I will say certainly where they are today, where they're still leveraged about 240 to 1, they don't have enough capital. So short answer is more. <laughs> that seems to be the answer of a lot of people who regulate financial yep. institutions. Would you hold off if you don't get what you want? Well, certainly if we don't think they're ready to, to leave conservatorship, they won't be leaving conservatorship. And it's not simply a capital as well. We want to make sure they're well-run institutions. I mean, most large institutions have supervisory matters they have to address. Most of these are confidential, so we have a number of confidential supervisory matters they need to fix. Uh, we are on the path to fixing those. And this is why I say as much as it would be great to see a capital raise sooner rather than later, there's just a lot of things that need to be done. Well, if you let them go and you do an equity offering, these would be the largest equity Absolutely. offerings probably ever. How do you prepare the markets for that? So, one, we want to be able to see whether we have to do this in multiple tranches. I mean, as you know, with AIG, it wasn't just one, one uh, equity raise. It was multiple equity raises. So we've got a financial advisor that we hired at FHFA, only been there for a little more than two weeks. So we're looking at alternatives. Can we do this at once? Does it need to be done multiple times? Do both companies need to go at once? Does it be sequential? These are all factors we're working on now, which, again, is another the reason why we're not ready to go to market today because there's just a number of important questions that in my view it'll take us a couple of months to lock down. Is it more likely they would go sequentially? I think so. I mean, we're not opposed. Again, you know, obviously if they both would at once and both try to do one large equity raise at a time, that would be a tremendous amount. I mean, that would essentially be the last like four or five years of IPOs combined at once. That's probably more than the market will uh, have an appetite for in one swoop. But we're going to look at that. We're going to talk to market participants. We're going to see how many times do we need to do this. Um, it would be great if they, both companies deal with all their issues and are ready to go at once, but we're not bound to that. If one company is ready to go, then we're going to go one, one at a time if that's need be. If you get the kind of equity offering that you would like to see, where does the cash go? How much goes to the government? How much do they retain for their capital? Well, right. Treasury's ultimately got to determine the value of its investment. As you know, Treasury not only has senior preferreds, Treasury has warrants on about 80% of, of the of the common, and we really need to have a resolution of that. And Treasury, and I'm working with Treasury on that, uh, and ultimately how much of that Treasury wants to sell or forgive is going to be up to Secretary Mnuchin. One last question. Uh, these are unusual organizations because... Understand. You run them, but there are still shareholders. Correct. What do you do with the, those shareholders who stand to benefit enormously? So I would certainly say that we don't have the authority today to wipe out the shareholders. Were we to find ourselves in a situation where they're insolvent again, we would wipe out shareholders. And my view is that's what should have been done in 2008. But where we are, we are where we are today, and we start from that premise. It's important to keep in mind that the shareholders haven't had a dividend for over a decade. Uh, the shareholders will be heavily diluted when we raise capital. So at the end of the day, I'm not focused on whether there's a windfall because I don't think there's really going to be that big of a windfall.